And yeah, I agree. And we talked about that before we would do this recording and then we do another uh, interactive show live where people can call in and or write in. And that awesome. sounds great. Um, That'd be great, Ken. Okay, great. And, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not confronting you on what you're saying. I am there with you. I understand what you're saying. I just know that uh, what you are directing yourself to achieve is not only achievable at that level, but a much broader, deeper, more comprehensive way. Um, and so that's why I ask you, you know, because, I mean, I ask you quite frankly, because some people are not open. Some people are, are very fixated and this is what I know and this is where I'm at and then this is where I'm going to stay. And, um, you know, why I've gotten to where I'm at is because I've never uh, limited myself. Okay, I know what I know now and I'm going to penetrate further. I'm going to stretch that envelope. I'm going to know more and integrate it more later. And I've let go of a vast amount of things. I still know them. I still have that knowledge and education of things that I used to do and apply, but I now know that they were self-limiting. Okay. And so, and that's the nature of the system. It's layered. It's dimensionally layered. And just uh, imagine if you had say 20 decks of cards, roughly a thousand cards stacked all in one stack. Okay. And if you try to take one card and push it through the top all the way through, you would get nowhere unless you, you know, broke it all up or cut the stack or something like that. But if you took that top card, you could slide it in between any level of that stack and you would comfortably slide it in between two cards. So you would be at, you know, imagine that's a thousand story building and on each story is a dimension. And in each dimension is an existence, people who operate and exist in a closed system that to them is reality and they understand it. Um, and, um, but they don't go up to the floor above and they don't go down to the floors below. And so if you think of the striations of reality construct in the minds of humanity, we're all in dimensions. Uh, you know, look at, you know, the Republican and Democratic, um, conventions like the, the Democratic last couple of days, and they're all crying because a woman is, uh, first presidential candidate and all that stuff, um, that's a reality, and they think that's real. They don't understand who Hillary Clinton really is. Um, <laughs> and if they really know, if they knew, they would be so aghast. <laughs> Some of them might jump off of that story building and go, my God, that's what I contributed to. But they don't. They're in that dimension. That's real for them. And if people above them try to explain it, they don't get it. So imagine the world system of the minds have been dimensionalized. And what's real at this dimension uh, for us is not real for those below us, but there's still dimensions to go up. And at some point, that whole collective world mind consciousness system is going to start breaking apart. And we're going to start seeing reality for what it is. And we're going to start being able to move through those dimensions, not in a ascending kind of thing none of that stuff because those are illusions of the mind but physically we will be here to see reality in a way we don't imagine can't imagine now so i've been through 25 years working with a lot of people i've seen a lot of people um, stop at a certain point there are still people who are adamant about secured party commercial process and i know that it's a it's a um it's a hook and they will hurt themselves eventually and hurt other people they tell to do it. I've seen it happen. I've seen the best of the best in that area in secured party commercial process do liens and all kinds of things, and most of them are in prison now. So were they I speak apparently? from that experience. Were, were, the people, were the people doing it also bar priests, attorneys? No, no, not at all. No, they're the same kind of people as you and I. They were committed to freedom. They were absolutely on this path. Of, of getting control of their lives and, and being free and teaching others. Well, that's, but that's what the, I'm saying is... That's the message, hmm? though. That's the message. They, they were not part. They were not a card-carrying member of that legal society. They're not allowed to be um, involved in that legal society. They don't have 
express. Well, yeah, no. Of co- yeah, of course. I understand that. And I don't want to go too far with this because I want to get to what uh, Jolly wants us to talk about last 15, 20 minutes. But the, the point is just, nev- you know, my motto is never stop, never limit myself, never think I know it all, never think I got it all figured out because there's always more that gets revealed. Always be willing to let go of what I thought was absolutely real. You know, and there's many things, like I said, that I thought were absolutely it. And now I know we're just one of the traps. So back to the dimensional layering, the legal system is structured that way. Each one of those layers or dimensions is sort of a self-contained system and it has its self-contained logic because the mind will look at them, figure it out and go, well, that that's real. That's right. Okay. I see it all like the secured party uh, commercial process and, and that is it. But it's a it's a closed system that when you leave it and you expand beyond it, you see its limitations. You see the hooks and the the traps that were built into it. So um, so that let you know that's all I'm saying about being open. Be open to learning more and be willing to let go of things that you thought were absolute at one time. Yes, I, I, I completely concur with that perspective. In fact, I've been through so many dimensional collapses, I'm really starting to question whether or not the floor beneath my feet is actually there. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, Great. Talk about, being, you know, talk about being open-minded. Okay. All right. Very good. <laughs> uh, we'll just make sure you're on the first floor and you're not on the thousand floor. It's a long way down. Um, so, so, so to, um, to your the, the 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 last phase of the conversation, um, okay. So it's it's basically as I said, walking into light, leaving the cult in the realm of the death. And I use the word realm because it's based on the word real, which is not real. See, that's the illusion of language. R E A L, like real estate. It's not real. It's actually part of the fiction. It's actually from the Latin or the Spanish real, which means royal. So the royal estate, when you're uh, in the re- in real estate, you're really attached to the fiction of the realm of death as the royal estate. So the word realm means the royal domain. So the ro- the so-called royal domain, those who would like to be our kings, queens, and, and aristocracy, they're dead. They're, they are the walking dead, and they're so far gone that they will very unlikely ever go into life. They will be given a choice, and they won't see what they do with that. But our job is to leave the attachment that we did volunteer to, we did consent to, and walk into into life. So our status correction process is a full comprehensive understanding, educational and specific application of how to do that. The understanding is to understand these things that we've been talking about, understanding um, how commerce works, how commerce is a battle, how we are presumed to be dead, civilly dead, lost at sea. That goes back to something called the SESTA KV Act. And as I said, everything is about estates and how property is held in an estate. And so there was always something within the royal estate where there was a land grant made patent from the sovereign that there, the estate was held, you know, as um, the property of the estate was held in the estate. And as an estate, it always had to have a beneficiary. And so there was always a living beneficiary. Sestic AV means living beneficiary. In, in literal translation means uh, that which is the life. Sestic AV literally for in law terms, legal uh, definition is the life by which the duration of an estate is measured. So if I'm Lord Mukti Muk and I have this estate, and I'm the SESTA KV, then it means the estate is measured in the duration of my life. I'm a SESTA KV. When my life ends, then I'm obviously not the life that is measuring the duration of that estate because I'm now dead. So then there's the passage by inheritance and the um, the passing of the estate to the next SESTA KV, which is, you know, in the past, the, the firstborn son and all of that. So there was always, and that's why, you know, the second, third, fourth born sons could never get anything because it would break the estate down. 
And if you look at the history of how they've broken property down into these decedent estates until we'd own nothing, it's because they knew they had to keep these master estates whole. So there would only ever be one living beneficiary who held the estate. So SESTA KV Act was about SESTA KVs would go to sea, you know, men who would go as captains of ships or whatever, and they'd go to sea and they would never come back. So they would be presumed dead, but um, they had no way to settle the estate because it was only a presumption of death. It had to be a finality of death. So they set a seven-year period that if there was presumption of death um, and the man did not return, his, he would be pronounced dead and the estate could be passed to the next living beneficiary. So... Um, so that was 1666, not a coincidence, the number, not a coincidence that that's when they started building the current city of London because this, the Great London Fire was a year before. Um, there are never coincidences. So um, they were creating this template because eventually everybody as a living being at birth would be considered a SESTA KV, but then when after seven years they did not come back and prove their standing as a living being, then the estate would be passed on. And then the state would now control it through the layer called the decedent estate, as I described. So in order to fully and absolutely disconnect from all those presumptions, you must stand and prove life and, um, uh, and claim the estate. Because if you read the rest of the SESTA KV Act in Section 4, it says, but, you know, some of these SESTA KVs may come back and prove to be alive. Um, if if you watch uh, the last or the second last, I think it was the last Hobbit movie. Uh, see, they always filter these things out into the media. Uh, watch the last Hobbit movie. Uh, Bilbo comes back and they're selling his estate off and he comes in. They say, prove you're, you're Bilbo. Prove you're the living man. And he has a document. He proves it. And he claims the estate. He takes it back. The same thing. You must claim the estate, the lineal ancestral estate that they claim was abandoned, starting with the birth or the afterbirth and the DNA and everything. And... Um, uh, and then proceed to settle the estate. What, what happens, so back to section four of the SESA KV Act, it says if a man returns from having been presumed or pronounced dead, lost at sea, comes back, proves his life, claims the estate, then all that was created as the profit and proceed as reversionary interest, that's what will revert to the living off of the the uh, maintenance or the management of the estate belongs to him. So you have to claim that. And so let's look at it in practical ways. Once the estate's abandoned and the state is now the acting executor with all of its pyramid hierarchy of actors, all the court and police officers and all the rest of it, they can continually create monetized debt through the facility of the franchise by writing that paper that you consent to be um, uh, the surety for and you volunteer to be the legal trustee and carry the liability. And then they create the bonds as I described. So um, they cannot take the substance or the principle of the estate so they can only monetize, which means putting collateral up. So, you know, if I have a house worth a million bucks and I own it supposedly free and clear, I go to the bank, say, here's collateral. They say, fine, we'll give you 70% loan to value. They're going to give me $700,000 loan. They've created new monetized debt that's fictional in nature on the name, the franchise. That's public debt. That means I'm still continuing as the surety and a bankrupt because that's debt in a bankrupt system. And um, now the estate has a debt obligation bonded on it, be retired. But when they create that, that monetized debt, whether it's a traffic ticket or a mortgage, they can then trade off of it. And when they trade it, buy, sell, and all kinds of trading they do on the macro scale of the global casino, they will create profit and proceeds. It doesn't belong to me for as long as I'm the bonded surety. It's equity that I cannot claim because I have no standing to claim it. 
because I'm lost at sea. I'm dead. I can't operate in that realm of the dead. But if I come back, prove my life, and claim the estate, then I start to be able to correct my status and start claiming the equity. So anything that was created in the past, I can set up a structure um, with trustees, which are the corporate military officers, and do certain steps, which is what we do in the status correction, to start compelling them to um, uh, to do what they're required to do, which is settle and extinguish to close those past debts, because that's what an executor has to do. For example, if if I'm a father and I die and I've left an estate worth three million dollars and I have um, three sons and I say, you know, each gets an equal one third, then will the executor be able to liquidate all the assets and just give them each a million dollars? No. The executor must first look at the liabilities. He must settle the liabilities. So if there's um, one and a half million dollars in debt, he must liquidate the assets 